All right, now that I'm actually recording my microphone and not wasting my time, let's do this episode. So, um, basically I realized that my laptop does not like to follow along when I do the highlighting, so I'm not going to do that. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to continue from where we were. And so we stopped right before the paragraph that talks about well ordering. So we talked about um, partial orders, total orders, maximal elements, upper bounds. And so now, if X is linearly ordered or totally ordered by this by an inequality, and every non-empty subset of the set X has a minimal element, then we say that X is well ordered by this inequality. And we call this inequality a well ordering on X. And for example, the natural numbers is well ordered by the standard less than or equal to. And why is this true? This is true because um, take any subset of the natural numbers. So the natural numbers, people argue whether it begins with zero or if it begins with one. I'll say it begins with one, but it doesn't really matter, particularly not for this case. So natural numbers will be one, two, three, four, all, all integers greater than or equal to one. Those are the natural numbers. Um, so take any subset of the natural numbers um, any non-empty subset. Um, to prove that the natural numbers are well ordered, this non-empty subset has to have a minimal element. So this non-empty subset has some element, let's call it k. Now if you look at the integers between 1 and k, there has to be a smallest integer which is contained in the subset. Um, let's call the smallest integer, let's see here, s for small. So there is some integer s between 1 and k, which is the smallest integer of, or the smallest element of our subset, which is between 1 and k. Then this must be a minimal element for the subset. Um, because if you choose any other element of the subset, either it's going to be between 1 and k, in which case it's greater than or equal to s, or it's going to be greater than k, in which case it's also greater than s. So s is less than or equal to every single, so s is an element of our subset, and it's less than or equal to every single element in the subset, and that means it's a minimal element. So for the natural numbers, um, they're well ordered because it's totally ordered, and every non-empty subset has a minimal element. Now the textbook says that this minimal element is necessarily unique. Um, and when the textbook says that, what they're saying is, okay, we're making a claim, but we're not proving it. That means it's not too difficult to prove, like there's no tricks involved, but we're leaving it up to you because we don't want to take up the space in the textbook to prove it. Um, so I went ahead and I wrote out a short proof of this. So what the claim is, is that if X is a totally ordered set, and if E is a non-empty subset with a minimal element, then this minimal element is unique. And to prove this, suppose we have two minimal elements of E. We'll call them X and Y. Um, so X is a minimal element. This means that for every z element Z of E, if Z is less than or equal to X, then Z must equal X. And in particular, this holds when z equals y, because y is an element of e. So if y is less than or equal to x, then y equals x. And similarly, since y is a minimal element, for all z and e, if z is less than or equal to y, then z equals y. And so using x in place of z, which we can do since x is an e, shows that if x is less than or equal to y, then x equals y. Now, recall that x is totally ordered, so that means that x and y are related in some way. So one of them is less than or equal to the other one. And we've shown that either inequality will imply that x equals y. And so it must be true that x equals y. Um, so any two minimal elements of E are equal, and so E has a unique minimal element. And that's the proof. All right, cool. So that is well orderings. So we now state a fundamental principle of set theory. Note that this is called a principle and not a theorem or a proposition. Well, let's look at it. 
It's called the Hausdorff Maximal Principle. It says that every partially ordered set has a maximal linearly ordered subset. Um, and if you think about, like, does it make sense that this should be true? Uh, it sort of makes sense. Like, you can sort of just, like, um, take a totally ordered subset or even just start with a single element and then you just, like, sort of loop through all the other elements in this set and you say, okay, can we add this element to... Can we include this element in the set that we started with and still get a totally ordered subset? Um, and if you can do it, you just throw it into your set. And if you can't do it, then you leave it out. And you keep doing this process, and your totally ordered subset keeps growing and growing, and eventually you should be able to do it until you can't do it anymore, in which case um, you've obtained a, maximally, a maximal totally ordered subset. Um, so I guess it kind of makes sense that it could be true, um, but I don't know. So let's see here. If in more detail, this means that if x is partially ordered by an inequality. There is a set E in x, which is totally ordered by the inequality, and no subset of x, which properly includes E, is also totally ordered. And here is another version of this principle. So this is just sort of a separate statement, and we'll show how they're related. So this is called Zorn's Lemma. Um, it states that if x is a partially ordered set and every totally ordered subset of x has an upper bound, then x has a maximal element. Um, and this is sort of like there's a lot of word, a lot of new words in this statement. Um, so it's sort of hard to tell if this should be true or false. Um, but if you think about, about it, like look at this. So par partially ordered set, every totally ordered subset has an upper bound. Then the entire set has a maximal element. So we're sort of jumping from upper bounds to maximal elements, which need not be the same thing. Um, so I guess this is sort of a strange statement, and um, I, I don't know, it's, it's hard to tell. I'd sort of, I'm sort of skeptical about this, whether or not this is true. Um, but if we're comparing the Hausdorff Maximal Principle and Zorn's Lemma, it turns out they're the same thing. So, clear, so this textbook says clearly, which is annoying, because if, you, if it's not clear to you, then you feel stupid. Um, but clearly the Hausdorff Maximal Principle implies Zorn's Lemma because an upper bound for a maximal linearly ordered subset of X is a maximal element of X. So that's sort of like an outline of the proof that the Hausdorff Maximal Principle implies Zorn's Lemma. Um, and you have to fill in the details. So instead of you filling in the details, I did it. All right, so Hausdorff Maximal Principle implies Zorn's Lemma. Um, so how would we rigorously prove this? So Hausdorff, so how, let's assume the Hausdorff maximal principle. So we assume every partially ordered set has a maximal totally ordered subset, and we want to prove Zorn's lemma. So we have to assume the um, beginning of Zorn's lemma, which is that if X is a partially ordered set and every totally ordered subset of X has an upper bound. So we assume X is partially ordered and we assume every totally, to, any, every totally, every totally ordered subset of X has an upper bound. So that's exactly what we say here. We must find a maximal element of X and we have to use Hausdorff maximal principle for this. Um, by the Hausdorff maximal principle, X has a maximal totally ordered subset of E. Um, and so E has an upper bound um, by assumption. Because, so X is a totally ordered subset. And Zorn's Lemma says that every, to every totally ordered subset has an upper bound. So let U be this upper bound, which is guaranteed by Zorn's Lemma. And basically, this is the only thing that we have to go off of. So we should assume that um, we can prove that U is in fact a maximal element of X. 
which means that for every y in x, if u is less than or equal to y, then u equals y. All right, so let's suppose y is an element of x such that u is less than or equal to y. Okay, so now if you take any element of e, any element lowercase e of the set e, that element e is going to be less than or equal to u, and by assumption u is less than or equal to y, which means that e is less than or equal to y because inequalities are transitive. So what this means is, so e is less than or equal to y for every element e of the set e. This means that the set e union with the element y is totally ordered because e itself was already totally ordered and y has a relation with every element of e. But remember that e is a maximal totally ordered subset of x. So e union this e with this element y, it cannot be bigger than e because e is maximal. So e must be equal to e union this element y, and that implies that y is in this set e. So y is in e, so, so all we know is that y is in x and that u is less than or equal to y, and that already tells us that y is in e. So every element of e is less than or equal to Every element of e is less than or equal to u since u is an upper bound. So y is less than or equal to x. So we have y is less than or equal to x, which we have proven, and we... That shouldn't be x, that should be u. y is less than or equal to u since u is an upper bound, and we assumed that u is less than or equal to y, and so u must be equal to y. And that proves, that's what we want to prove. We want to prove that for all y and x, if u is less than or equal to y, then u equals y. And that's what we've proved. Hence, u is a maximal element. So, we've proven that if you take the assumptions of Zorn's lemma, come on, work with me. Work with me, computer. There we go. If we take the, uh, the assumptions of Zorn's lemma and we use the Hausdorff maximal, no. Yeah, if, if we take the, the assumptions of Zorn's lemma, we suppose if x is partially ordered and every totally ordered subset of x has an upper bound, then we can use max, Hausdorff maxim, maximal principle to find a maximal element. And so therefore Zorn's lemma holds. And so the Hausdorff maximal principle implies Zorn's lemma. All right. And if my computer will cooperate, let's wrap this up and prove the reverse inequality. It is also not difficult to see that Zorn's lemma implies the Hausdorff max maximal principle. And again, they tell us how to do the proof. Apply Zorn's lemma to the collection of totally ordered subsets of X, which is partially ordered by inclusion. Okay, so there's a couple of different orders that we're using on different sets. So let's go through this step by step. So let's see, we're doing Zorn's lemma implies Hausdorff Maxwell principle. Okay, so let x be partially ordered by some inequality. We want to find a maximal totally ordered subset of x. So let's have t refer to the collection of all subsets of x which are totally ordered by this inequality. Um, note that this collection of subsets T is partially ordered by inclusion. Um, and I write out why this is the proof here, but um, if we remember, that was actually mentioned way back at the um, beginning of this section. Um, and I talked through the proof, so I'm not going to talk through it again here. It's pretty short. Um, but I wrote it out. Okay. So, we want to prove the Hausdorff maximal principle. So we know Zorn's lemma, we're assuming Zorn's lemma to be true. So we need to apply it some way. Um, so Zorn's lemma, for Zorn's lemma to apply, x needs to be partially ordered and every total, totally ordered subset has to have an upper bound. Okay, so we need every totally ordered subset of t to have an upper bound in order to apply Zorn's lemma to t. So again, that's also important. We're applying the, the, the set x in Zorn's lemma's statement, we're using t in place of that. Okay, so 
we need to prove that every totally ordered subset of T has an upper bound. So given a totally ordered subset, um, we'll call it A alpha, where alpha ranges over some indexing set I. So if this collection is like A1, A2, A3, blah, 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 then I could be, the indexing set could be the integers or the natural numbers. We could also have an uncountable collection here in which the indexing set is an uncountable set like the reals. Um, but in any case, let's take a totally ordered subset of T and we want to find an upper bound. So let's just take the union of, the, of everything. We'll call it A. A is the union of all, L, all of the A alphas. And I claim that this is the desired upper bound. And well, for that to be true, every element of T has to be less than or equal to A with our relation. And the relation on T is subset. So every alpha, every A, let's see here, every A beta needs to be a subset of A. But that's obviously true because A is the union of all of the A alphas. And in particular, beta is, so this is the union over all alpha in I, and in particular, beta is in I, and so A beta will be a subset of A. And this is true for every beta in I. So, and so, and this, this uh, totally ordered subset of A alphas was chosen arbitrarily. So every totally ordered subset of T has an upper bound. So by Zorn's lemma, T itself has a maximal element and let's just call it M. So this is a maximal element with respect to inclusion of the collection of totally ordered subsets of X. And so by definition, that means exactly that M is a maximal totally ordered subset of X. And that's what we are looking for. And so the Hausdorff maximal principle holds. So there we go. Um, we looked at these two things, the Hausdorff maximal principle and Zorn's lemma. And it looked like we, we weren't quite sure what to make of them, if they should be true, if they shouldn't be true. Um, and for now, all we know is that they're actually this, the same exact thing. And so um, to establish whether or not they're true, well, we need to keep doing more work um, to sort of see what to make of these. But for now, we know that they're the same thing.